Namaste. So we will continue our discussion. And before we start, we will do uh, our usual Shanti Mantra. And then begin. Om Shri Guru Bhyavar Mahatmari Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Ubhunaktu, Sahavidyan Karavavahe, Tejasvina Vadhe Tamastuma Vipushavahe, Om Shanti 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 Om Patsapat. Okay, so we are discussing about Karma Yoga. And in that, we were mentioning Vishwara Pranidhanam, how the understanding and appreciation of the role of Ishwara in our everyday life. That's how we should see that. It has different levels. So, surrender to Ishwara would be the pinnacle of bhakti. So, surrender and jnana are not different. A normal person cannot surrender immediately, but can offer the attachments, like how, let us say, you got, we have this wonderful habit uh, in India, especially in, among Hindus, let us say you got a Let us uh, let us say you got a, a new phone. So what do they do? Or a new computer. They go and keep it in the puja. And then take the blessings. And then take it. So basically you are offering it to the Lord. And then taking it as prasada. So whatever we receive in life, we receive as prasada. We do this for all the good things. But when it comes to negative experiences... Do we have the same attitude? Why do we take it as see when God's grace is what is facilitating something desirable coming to our life? Then it should be the same God's grace that is also facilitating what is undesirable, what is an undesirable or an unpleasant experience. Also, it's a sign of God's grace. So you cannot consider you need not consider it as a punishment because. Sukha Dukkha Samu Bhuktva, the Samatvam Yoga Vichyate. Right? So, the learning to treat pleasant and unpleasant in the same manner with equanimity. So, that equanimity is yoga. Now, equanimity means what? Both pleasant experiences and unpleasant experiences are a context for cultivating Viveka and Vairatya, are context for cultivating the preparedness of the mind for Jnana. So that is the attitude of a Karma Yogi. A Yogi is a person who is convinced about Moksha as the only goal. We discussed that, Vyavasaya, Atmika, Buddhi, and all that. So a person who is convinced about moksha as the only worthy goal has moksha as the ultimate ulterior goal or motive in every little objective of the life. Suppose I am striving for excellence in my studies. Let us say, I am doing some course, I have to do it well. So I, am, I want to do it well as an exercise for cultivating some quality of mind like Ekagrata, like Samatvam, like Samadamadi, all that. The, you know, the uh, endurance, the riksha, Samadama, Uparama, all those things, you know, the control of the mind, control of the senses, uh, one-pointedness, uh, detachment, and learning to prioritize so when I am focused on a task, a well-chosen dharmic task, when I am focused on the task, I have an opportunity to look at my background. I have an opportunity to understand my ego structure on how I am affected, how the different situations of life 
are acting like a mirror for myself, for my mind. So in the context of life, when I am going on, when I am facing life as a karma yogi, every situation is a mirror. It is telling me how I am. Every experience is a mirror because how I am affected by an experience tells a lot about myself as a person, as an ego, as an ego structure, how my intellect is, how my samskaras are, an object comes in front of me, how my inner core from my inside, from my background, how my background responds to that object tells about what kind of samskaras are there in me. A beautiful uh, uh, story. There was a, a, a very saintly uh, Upanyasaka in Tamil Nadu called Kripananda Varya. So somebody went and asked him, Swami, what is, uh, who is a vegetarian and who is a meat eater, non-vegetarian? So here we say Shaivam Asaivam. Shaivam, generally it is as vegetarianism, like how in North India it is associated with Vaishnavism, we say when we go to Haridwar, etc., we say Vaishnav Dhava and all that. So Vaishnavism is associated with vegetarianism in North India. Similarly, uh, Shaivism is associated with vegetarianism in South India. Not to uh, not to uh, create difficulties and pain for other beings and all that. Right? So, so Shaivam in Tamil Nadu we say Shaiva Sapada, uh, the Shaivam food, uh, Shaivite food. So, which is vegetarian food. So he asked Shaivam, who is Shaivam, who is Asaivam, who is vegetarian, who is non-vegetarian in this context. So this Kripananda Varyar, he tells him, it's a fantastic explanation. He says, when you see a cute, little, well-grown, you know, a healthy, cute, beautiful baby goat, you know, a lamb. When you see a healthy, cute, beautiful lamb, it is hurt on the road or somewhere. It is hurt. It is there. It cannot move. When you look at it, if you get tears in your eyes, you are Shaivam. You are vegetarian. If you get, if you get, in fact, it says, if you, if you get water in your eyes, you are vegetarian. If you get water in your mouth, you are non-vegetarian. You know? So this is a samskara. So we are not telling, uh, but it's a fantastic explanation. It tells about how samskara, the deep-seated tendency, uh, you know, give the direction for action in our life. So that's what it is. How our unconscious mind is constructed, how our samskaras are constructed. So the whole point of karma yoga is to, to, to work out our samskaras and to rise above our samskaras, to use the context when, when one has a samskara for action, when one is the extroverted, introverted also, here it's not personality. When one is uh, uh, an active person, generally, one, 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 when our mind naturally goes outside, senses are outside. And we have just understood moksha as the goal. But our background is yet to catch up with our goal. I know moksha is the only goal. That's what we discussed about preparedness for moksha, about preparedness of, for sannyasa. How the Lord says, uh, you know, karma niyavadikara say, you are qualified only for action. That means you are not ready for becoming a monk. You are not ready for sannyasa. In, in, uh, in one of the Bhashyans, we have that explanation, right? So, means what? Sannyasa is the means for moksha. Sannyasa, accompanied by jnana, or jnana accompanied by sannyasa is the direct means for moksha. But, even though I understand the goal, my system, my samskara, my unconscious mind and my uh, ego structure is not ready for that lifestyle. It's not mature enough for pure contemplation. There is a lot of catching up to do from my background. So for that person, it is Karma Yoga context, right? So every situation when we face, a pleasant situation is pleasant because it affects me in a certain way. An unpleasant situation is unpleasant because it affects me in a certain way. So both in a pleasant situation and in an unpleasant situation, I am busy looking at myself, not being lost in the enjoyment or suffering. 
So that gives samatha. Cultivating this attitude, this habit of using every experience as a mirror to look at myself. Look at myself in the sense, my mind. So the sense, the word self can be used in different ways in different contexts. For example, Uddhare Tatman Atman, we have uh, you know, uplift the self by your own self. How can you know, are you supposed to catch your kudumi and lift yourself up? No. Here it means uplift the lower mind using the higher mind in the sense, uplift your manas, your chitta using the buddhi, uplift your unconscious personality and subconscious personality using your conscious, beautiful thinking mind. So apply your understanding and uh, you know uh, make the you know bring up bring up the quality of the or uh, refine and reform and make the habit driven person rise up to the ideal. So that's what it means. So similarly, in a situation when we are affected, when when the mind is affected in an experience, we see how it is affected. And in order to do that, in order to not obsess ourselves with the result of the action, in order to not be obsessed with the experience, oh my God, oh all bad things are happening only to me. Oh, wow, oh, I did it. You know, when something good happens, you are jumping and either you are lucky and you know, you're thanking God and jumping up and down. That is one level. It's okay, at least you are thanking God. Or you know, you are jumping and uh, you are completely lost in the enjoyment. Like in Ramayana, we have... Uh, you know, uh, once Sugriva uh, got his uh, uh, throne after Rama killed Wali, Sugriva got his throne. But before killing Wali, he had promised there was a trade. He promised that he will send his sign and everything to search for Sitama. But uh, what he did, once he got the throne, he got completely carried away in the celebration of the kinghood. And he was enjoying his life and completely forgot about what he promised. Then Lakshmana goes and gives him a gentle warning. No, okay, not so gentle warning. And then he runs and falls at the feet of Rama and then asks for forgiveness and then uh, uh, gets gathers himself for the task. Right. So when there is an enjoyment, we tend to lose in that. And when there is a suffering, we tend to bog, get bogged down by that because we are defining ourselves as the experience. We are completely lost in the bhokta. Just like how we are completely lost in the karta. So that is when what we do when we understand that you know, the, the excessive value we have for an experience, excessive value we have for the result. That assigning an excessive value for the result, that habit of the buddhi will come down. That The force of that habit will come down slowly and eventually that habit will transform into complete detachment. How? Every time you experience the result of an action, both positive and negative, just like how you would keep the phone in the altar and take it as prasadam. Similarly, even when a bad experience comes, an unexpected, unpleasant experience comes or a result comes, that also you offer at the altar mentally. Oh, this is all, this is your prasadam. Thank you. I don't know why you have given me this experience. I will try to understand it in the right perspective. And first you say thank you. Thank you a lot for this uh, experience. You understand it is uh, unpleasant. That is your first response. Then immediately your karma yoga buddhi kicks in. Immediately your yoga buddhi kicks in and then you say, oh God, thank you for this. This is your prasada. So today you have decided to give me this prasada. So one day the boss is very nice to you. Oh God, today your prasada. No, boss was very nice. This is your prasada. Thank you. You come back to your seat. In your seat, you keep a little Ishta Devata one picture or something in it under the monitor. Many people have in the office. Then you are inside your drawer. If your office is too secular, so you put that, uh, you know, your altar is there inside the drawer. You open and then, thank you. Today, boss was very nice. It was your grace. Boss gave a nice gali beer. That is your boss, you know, scolded you left and right. Uh, maybe some misunderstanding. Even though it is not your fault, you get scolded sometimes or you get uh, censured sometimes. So mentally say, oh, thank you, Lord. Come here, open the drawer, look at the look at the picture, whatever you have there, Ishta Devata. Oh God, today you are Prasadam. Uh, thank you. He, he, you know, you just talk about it. You can talk about it to your Ishta Devata. Suppose let us say your Ishta Devata is Hanuman. 
open and then you drop it in. You just say your mantra, or just a few Ram Nam, and then you just let your mind talk to them. You know, today the boss talked at me, this was your prasad in today. Because of your grace, I got this experience. And during this, this was my, this is how I was feeling and all that. You talk to the date and you. So every time you get a negative experience, offer the negative experience at the altar of your Ishtadevas. Just like how you would offer a positive experience in gratitude, offer a negative experience also in gratitude. So when we do that, we awaken to a certain space in our mind. We, we develop a certain attitude in our mind that rises beyond the enjoyer. The space in yourself that is not affected by the doer and enjoyer. You can't open your consciousness to that space. You become more conscious of that space where you are not affected by the results of actions. By cultivating this equanimity, because equanimity in the form of offering the results of action to your, to the Lord in the form of your Ishtadevata. So this is what a Jishwara Pranidana basically begins with that. So remembering that when you are receiving the result of action, just like how you remember the Lord in the form of Dharma, during the choice of the right course of action. Similarly, you remember Lord as the giver of the result of actions and receive the result of action as prasadam from the Lord. And now during the performance of action. So during the performance of action, you just think of the Lord and then say, I'm doing this action as an offering to you and focus on the task. So it is not, you know, remembering doing the act as an act of devotion to the Lord does not mean you go into some special visualization meditation, uh, you know, where you are uh, doing uh, every uh, every move, you know. And uh, for example, you are a surgeon, let us say. While doing surgery, you cannot visualize the Lord and all your meditation techniques. You have to do the surgery. You have to concentrate that. You know, otherwise the person can die. So when you are doing some action, concentrate on the tools and the moves required for the action. You don't have to keep thinking about and visualizing your Mr. Devada while you are doing action. No. Before you start the action, say, I'm doing this and this act, I'm doing it, it's a worship for you. We keep that sankalpa. It's going to be there in the back of the mind, right? Like how, uh, you know, and then uh, like how a soldier, for example, he is fighting in the front line. Now, all his focus is there on, you know, hitting the enemy. But in the back of the mind, his motivation to stay alive is I have to go home. I have a family. I have to, they are all waiting for me. Right? There is a point where he has to rise above that and sacrifice his life if required. He will do that. But generally I am saying. So if, if there is a survival situation and there is a situation where he should not give up against any odds, I have to go back home. I heard that that's one of the main motivations. Also, you know, I have to, if you are a leader, I have to be there to make my team, make my platoon or whatever, you know, my, my, my fellow soldiers in our Platoon has to win, you know, our company or platoon, we have to win this uh, in, in this uh, situation. Or, you know, we have we all have to, you know, I should save everybody's life. I have to use the right strategy. So when doing all that, there is that ulterior motive that is there in the mind. So that motivates the person to keep going, right? So similarly, this uh, dedication, this, this dedication of an act as an act of worship of an action that we have chosen, right? to perform that action as an act of worship. When we start that action, before we begin the job, we think of the Lord and say, I am going to do this as an offering. Like, consider this as my puja for you. And may I be able to do this for you well. So when we are in the puja room and we are, you know, when we are doing a worship with a lot of bhakti and everything, how we will do, how involved, we, how sincere we will be. We will not, you know, we will not, we cannot, cheat, we cannot cheat ourselves, we cannot make uh, some stupid compromises because you know that Lord knows your intentions, right? So, that complete integrity, how we, so when we bring the puja attitude in action, automatically that complete integrity comes. During the action, So while during that, during the action, we concentrate on whatever faculties we have to use for doing the action very well. 
while doing that sometimes what happens this is one so we don't keep thinking about you know we don't keep uh, uh, you know doing some kind of uh, meditative visualizations connected with your devata and all doing the actions because because nowadays what happens uh, we are all very technique uh, we have become very technique oriented being in this uh, field of yoga dhyana and all that i have come across many people who are very technique oriented so they want a technique for everything so what is the karma yoga technique for doing action how to technically offer i don't know probably somebody is doing a workshop how to make your actions as a mystic offering i don't know you know there's all kinds of workshops probably somebody is doing this workshop also and then they are teaching some technique on how to do it concentrate on your eyebrow center and keep breathing you know this kriya yoga people are this obsession so whatever they are doing they will concentrate on the eyebrow center fold the tongue up and you know you keep doing that kriya breathing or you concentrate on that uh, this chakra or that chakra and then you are doing this pranic healing kriya yoga all these people you know they are always working on some chakra all the time you don't do that so when you are as a karma yogi i mean I, if you are in that school you do whatever but in karma yoga on doing an action as an offering to the lord means just remembering the lord before the action and how during the action this attitude will be in the background how do you and how do you come back so what you have to do is if the attitude is in the background that you are doing as an offering to the lord we will not have anxiety about the result if we are doing an action as an act of worship there is not going to be anxiety towards the result but while doing from the background if you feel some tension coming about the result some anxiety coming about the result you know you just you are you don't fight it don't fight it the anxiety comes you just become aware of it. just remember just remember the lord's name once and just connecting to the attitude that you are doing this as a worship result result will come according to the will of the lord whatever result comes is lord's prasada result is lord's responsibility not my responsibility my responsibility what i have i know that is the result and of course there are some things that requires us to update our path no our path of action we are doing something like for example uh, uh you are uh, let us say managing somebody's portfolio and then there is going to be some hindenburg or whatever some kind of crash or whatever is it is there you know all kinds of alert things are coming so you have to keep on monitoring and keep altering and uh, you know you have to alter the portfolio investment portfolio of a person so you are a portfolio manager and you have to do all that right so when you are doing that you cannot say oh i have already allotted his portfolio whatever result comes is in the lord's hands no monitoring the course of action and making any alterations required in the course of action if the job demands that we have to do that so that so surrendering an action to the lord doesn't mean becoming completely blind to the process so once you understand this is the process and the discipline and the methodology required for the particular result for which the action we are doing so we don't do action see detachment to the result does not mean i don't care and i keep doing whatever i want blindly simply for my meditation sake because i cannot keep quiet and to hell with all the result no it's not like that it's not you know then it becomes like you know i did my job it becomes like a, a public pwd job you know somebody will come and uh, dig the somebody will come and put the road and go after they put the road and go another department will come and dig the road so you know we have seen that in our country uh, so this uh, this is not what i'm talking about so whatever is the intelligence required to perform that action to the utmost perfection we have to apply that intelligence not do some weird meditation technique while doing action so that the action gets affected not that it just a background attitude every time an anxiety comes while you are performing an action about the result or something let go of the result just just become aware of the anxiety and there is a force behind the anxiety there is a force inside the anxiety use that force to chant the name of your ishtadev that just you know the name or the mantra as opposed to rama and charan use the force of that anxiety to chant the mantra this is a very useful technique only when anxiety comes not all the time so the force of use the force of that result anxiety there is a force inside there is a force 
use that force to chant the mantra a few times. And while chanting, just in the background, remember, you know, while doing some job, you can always remember, ah, today is, uh, uh, today uh, I'm going to have some masala dosa for lunch, you can remember. So similarly, you can remember this action I'm doing as an act of worship. Whatever is required for this is all, all, these are all the steps I have to take to ensure the result I'm doing, but the result is not in my hands. Whatever, in spite of all that I do, it may not happen. And even if I, uh, you know, I, I'm not doing my work, sometimes it can happen. So there are infinite number of variables controlling the result. So I cannot control how what result will come. But still, I can control what I am doing for the sake of that result. So and I am doing it with an attitude of worship because I am not defined by the result. I am defined by my, I am defining the success in action. I am defining the success in action by the level of yoga buddhi that I am able to employ during the action. The level of yoga buddhi I am able to employ by choosing the action. The level of yoga buddhi I am able to employ while doing the action. And the level of yoga buddhi I am able to employ at the end of action and at the time when I am enjoying or experiencing the result of action. So this is what defines my success. So no matter what is the external result, I am always, that is why the Lord says there is no failure for a person who is a, uh, taking, who is doing action as a yoga. There is no, there is only success for this person. You know? And also, you know, there is no fear of uh, omissions and commissions. All these problems of a person who is uh, uh, doing action as a bogey, whatever person or problem that person has, a yogi does not have. So it is cognitively liberating, that's what it says. Karma yoga is cognitively liberating. When we are doing something in an attitude of yoga, progressively we are, we are becoming free from our bondage to the cycle of action and result. So that is, that is the result we are experiencing. No matter what external result we get. Because luck plays a huge role in so many uh, situations in life. Because there are so many variables that we cannot control. So we put all that variable in a box and call it Lord. So Lord takes care of the result. We remember that. So when an anxiety comes during the course of an action, you suddenly become anxious or something. Use the force inside that. Don't try to fight the anxiety. Let that anxious you talk to the Lord. If you're feeling anxious, just remember the Lord, the, the Ishta Devata with the mantra or with the Nama. Uh, the, 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 there is a divine names of the Shiva is there. If you like, if you have Lord Ram, Rama, you can say Rama, 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 or Rama, 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 or Shiva, Shiva, or you know, uh, Shiva, Tena, Maha, or whatever. And then you know, Murga, Murga, whatever you have remembered, uh, you know, your the Lord's name that is close to your heart. Remember that and let that anxiety, you that anxious you, let that anxious you talk to the Lord. It's like. There is a somewhere that force is there. Let the, direct the force towards the Lord and offer all that anxiety and the result that is good. And then the anxiety will calm down. Again, you are back to the process. So only when it comes, you remember the Lord through the name of the mantra and offer that force of anxiety at the Lord's feet mentally at the altar. You just have to remember, you know, when the anxiety comes, the anxious you should go to the in front of your favorite altar, either in front of the temple, Garbhagraha, or the front of your altar where you do puja every day. Just take the background mind in front of the altar. Just remember the altar. Like how you would remember a masala dosa for lunch. Just remember the altar. The anxious you goes there and tell the nama and then offer that whole situation and anxiety. Let it flow towards him in the back of the mind. You focus on what you have to do. A beautiful example is given by Sri Ramakrishna that, you know, how to live in the world. Like he says, how uh, a woman in a village in those days, right? Even today in Rajasthan, many places, when the, the tap water is not there, they go far away from the village and fetch water from the river and come you know, in pots. If not for anything, at least you are bringing the water for puja. So he says, you know, when a, <clears throat> so when a woman carries a pot, there is one pot in the head, one pot in the in the hip, there is another pot in the hand. Two, three women, they go to the river and come back. They are talking all kinds of things. But the mind, the attention, the background attention is always there in the pot. So like that, the background attention 
is always in a state of devotion to the Lord, in the remembrance of the Lord, in remembrance of the, it is not like, you know, she's not, it is not, it's not a work. It's a background attention. It is a certain importance that we give, that woman gives to the pot. Because of that, the, the, the brain is conditioned to be aware of the balance. The moment something goes wrong in the balance, she will catch it. No matter what she is talking about. Right? And she is not immersed in the conversation deep enough to lose balance. It's, it's that, that fine balance between the foreground action and the background attitude. Similarly, they say, you know, when a, when a, when a, uh, they say, you know, when a woman is uh, having, a, if she's in love with somebody, She's doing all the work and then while doing the work, she's thinking of her lover in the background. So a person, let us call it a person in love, remembers the lover in the background while doing all that. Right. So like that, it's there in the background, it says, like you know your name. When you're doing your work, are you keeping repeating in your mind that, you know, let us say my name is Yogeshwar. I don't keep repeating my name is Yogeshwar, my name is Yogeshwar in the background while doing everything. So that only then somebody calls Yogeshwar, I will turn, oh, I am Yogeshwar, Yogeshwar, my name is Yogeshwar. So I should turn and say hello. It's not like that. No, my name is Yogeshwar. It's there in the background. So how do I know it is there in the background? The moment somebody calls my name, that comes in the samskara, because of the samskara or the attitude or the assumption that I am, my name is Yogeshwar. Somebody calls that name immediately from deep inside me, there is a response. Ah, no, that alertness, something wakes up from the background. Right? When somebody calls your name, so similarly, when we are doing an action, when the anxiety about the result comes, immediately the thought of the Lord comes, the mind goes and offers the force, force of anxiety at the Lord and then gets back to the attitude that all the result belongs to the Lord. When we keep on making it a habit, when we make this kind of a background uh, discipline of not getting carried away by result anxiety, but we learn to turn it around as an act of offering and an act of active remembrance of the Lord, of the principle of God as the one that is holding everything and the one who is responsible for action, for the result of actions. When we do that, slowly that samskara develops, that surrender develops in the back. That Ishwara Pranidhana, surrendering or you know, resting the result of actions at, at the Lord, that is offering all of our actions as an act of devotion to the Lord, that attitude builds up in the background. Just like how your conditioning, my name is so and so, has built up in the background. I am so and so, is built up in the background. Right? So like that, how that so many bhavas about ourselves we build up, right? So similarly, this bhava build up, builds up in the background as an abstract dimension in our mind. And it backs up, it becomes like a background attitude in all of our actions. So this build-up of this samskara, Ishwara Pranidhana, Ishwara Bhakti or Yoga Bhakti becomes a samskara in our intellect, in the background intellect. And it, it serves as the, a stable platform on which the action happens, uh, in, on the stable platform from which we act. That is what is Yoga Stha Guru Karmani, being established in yoga perform action. So how do I establish myself in yoga? By practicing like this. Before choosing an action, doing an action, constantly coming back to my attitude whenever there is result anxiety. And whenever pride comes, result anxiety is one. And then suddenly I feel like, you know, I am, I am awesome and I am great. That self-pride comes up. I offer that pride. This is all because of your grace. All the body is maintained by me. All the panchabhutas are maintained, sorry. Body is maintained by you. Panchabhutas are maintained by you. Or whatever there is a greatness that is showing here and the talent that is uh, manifesting in my body and mind belongs to you, Lord. No? So you offer that from the pride. Whenever pride comes, you offer that as a turn the pride into gratitude. Whenever, uh, you know, and, and turn, remove your credit. Offer, you know, that is give the credit of the positive achievement to the Lord. Every time you have a pride about something very good that you did, let the credit go. Whenever there is an unpleasant experience, let it be received as an act of, uh, received as a, a sign of grace from the Lord. Because it gives an opportunity for you to look at yourself. So, unpleasant is as much as a blessing as the pleasant. 
and the pleasant is as much occurs as the unpleasant. How the pleasant is as much as occurs in the unpleasant? Because if I am attached to the pleasant and I'm constantly driven by the by maintaining the pleasant, I get into samsara. That's exactly what samsara is. It reinforces my attachment. Because excessive involvement in a pleasant experience reinforces my attachment. Being a cause of reinforcing the attachment, the pleasant attachment over a period of time. The pleasant, the pleasant becomes unpleasant over a period of time. Because it becomes a cause for attachment. The unpleasant is also pleasant because it becomes a context for practice of equanimity. The unpleasant also is considered as pleasant because it contributes to my detachment. So there is pleasant in the unpleasant and unpleasant in the pleasant. So let us not get carried away by either and develop the attitude of receiving every experience as a prasada from the Lord and constantly, you know, that and reinforce that attitude of yoga, ishwara, pranidhana and bhakti in the background. So this is this is basically the approach of uh, uh, this is basically the approach of karma yoga. Now, what I will say now, it works for a person who has shraddha bhakti, who is able to appreciate have a devata series. What to do? If you don't have samskar. Suppose if I don't have the bhakti samskar and I don't have the uh, you know any special feeling like there are people who are not born in this culture who are attracted to yoga. There are people uh, in the Western countries. The people may not have uh, come from a religious background. They might have come from a secular, you know, from you know, some kind of atheist background. But then they suddenly see that the philosophy part of it makes sense. But you can't ask the guy to go and do bhajan because the guy doesn't have any, you know, that 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 the samskara is not there. So when the bhakti samskara is not there, when the saguna bhakti samskara, when you are when you don't have the samskara for for the attitude, the conditioning the background, cultural conditioning or whatever is required for worship through a form, worship of the Lord or relating to the Lord through a, through a divine form. And that samskara is not there. In my opinion, it is better to not cultivate it fresh, especially when you are an adult. If you are a child, probably it can be cultivated. But when you are an adult, uh, because whoever is here now listening to my discourse is probably an adult. So when you are an adult, even you are post your teen, there is no point forcibly cultivating a very cultural uh, bhakti. It may be useful for, you know, it may be very useful for uh, running ashram, making all the people without the background, make them memorize. They may like it. If the person likes it, fine. There are people who come from a foreign culture, you know, who are into bhajan and puja and everything they enjoy it. And they are very deep into it. Probably they have samskara from past life. So just try it out a little bit. Try your saguna bhakti for a little bit. Saguna bhakti means devotion to Ishwara, appreciating Ishwara through a divine form. That's saguna bhakti. Through the divine forms given in the Vedic tradition only. So that's what when I say uh, when we say you know. Uh, for example, here when it comes, uh, we have this thing. Sarva Deva Namaskara Kesham Pradikachadi. So, whatever form one worship, all forms, all worship goes to the same Lord. So, I have, you know, Ekam Sadhvitra Bahuda Vadanti. All this is there. It is that one truth. It, but it is always called, you know, it is sometimes called as Indra, it's sometimes called as Varuna, it's sometimes called as uh, Surya, it's sometimes called as Vishnu or Shiva, Rudra, like that. It comes. So, if you take that statement, it is only mentioning. Vipraha Bhavuda Vadanti. Vipraha means Veda Dhyayet Iti Vipraha. A person who has studied the Veda and understands understand the meaning of the Veda, that person is a Vipra. So Vipra does not mean the knowers or the wise people of all cultures. Vipra is a very specific word. It means only the person who has studied and understood the Veda. Veda means Rigyaju Sama Haruva. Right? So, in these four categories, whatever has been classified in all the shakas and everything, this and Veda, Purana, Itihasa, all put together. So, this is Purana. This is this is what it is. So, with so 
Vipraha Bhagdavadanti means all the different ways in which the Lord is referred to in this tradition. It does not apply to the foreign religions. It does not apply to Jesus or Allah. Here it means only the uh, Devadas that are native to the Vedic tradition. That's what it means here. So when we say Ishwara Pranidhana, this is what it means. So when I say a divine form, the divine form has to belong to Sanatana Dharma. It has to belong to the Vaidika Sampradaya or Tantric Sampradaya. Tantric Sampradaya is also an extension of the Vaidika Sampradaya. etc. So Astika, Vaidika, Tantrika, Adama, Sampradaya, whatever divine form belongs to that, that is what I am mentioning here for the purpose of Sarguna Bhakti or relating to the divine through a form. I am not defining, I am not including, you know, some Celtic gods and all that. So whatever is there or, you know, some kind of the uh, some Norse gods, or I'm not including the you know the Christian icons, the angels, and I'm not including uh, Allah. I'm not including any of them. I'm including. I'm, I'm talking only about this. Why? Because only these divine forms are given through the revelation of the Veda. They have a relationship with the each person. For example, there is a Rabbit. Rabbit is there in nature. There is a rhinoceros. It's also there in nature. Rhinoceros has a horn. Rabbit does not have a horn. So rabbit horns the same for so joke. I can create an animal in my design, like how they create for animation. I can create an animal which looks like a rabbit but has a horn for eye. Probably I call it as Rabino or whatever. Now, this is Jeeva Srishti. I am creating. So, what is not having its basis in the Veda, which is claiming a supernatural status, it is not considered as Pramana. It is not considered as a valid knowledge about the supernatural. If there is no mapping in the Veda, you are, you know, there, is, there is no Shruti Pramana or Shini Shastra Pramana is not there then it is not to be considered. You may use it as a psychological prompt. There is nothing wrong. You can also use But when I am saying Ishwar Pranidhana, there are two aspects to it. One is the psychological effect of surrender and all that. Also, it invokes an unseen. There is a, what is called as Adrishta Palam. The act of worship, the process of worship and the different actions we do for devotion like Puja, Japa, etc., they create a certain punya and they invoke the blessing because uh, saguna means a divine form, a revealed divine form has an ability to manifest a certain intangible grace in our life. Samadhi Siddhir Ishwara Pranidhana says Patanjali Yoga Sutra and the commentary says that because the Lord wishes that let him have Samadhi. So, even in uh, Vedanta, we hear, you know, Ishwara Dhanugraha Deva Kumsa Advaita Vasana. Only by the Lord's grace, a person develops. Kumsa means actually man. A man develops Advaita Vasana. So because, because I am talking about a traditional concept, it is my responsibility to present the traditional, actual traditional meaning. So when we say Ishwara Pranidhana, if you are choosing a divine form, the divine form has to be from the Vedic Tantric tradition only. If you want the entire effect of Ishwara Pranidhana. If it is not, if it is a Jeeva Sritti, if it is a personal imagination or some historical figure, you might even, you know, consider, uh, you might even imagine Michael Jackson as your uh, uh, Ishwara. There's nothing wrong, you know, some tube light in your house also can be taken because everything is the Lord, you will argue. That is all right. But then that projection or that imagination, that superimposition comes from the intelligence level of our mind. It does not have a cosmic resonance. Not everything has a cosmic resonance. When you say, for example, sir, we say that. The wise, sir, this is the swara, right? So why is that which sounds like sir, it doesn't sound. No, there is a uh, uh, disharmony there. So in the harmonics and all that, there is a frequency, there is a pattern. No, there is a universal pattern that resonates in everything. Like for example, the Fibonacci series, 
it is there in the shape of the snail in so many things you have the fibonacci series reflecting so there are this uh, divine there are these what we call as uh, what we call as the divine patterns in life right so when we are using the forms given in the veda they have a certain kind of a divine resonance they have a certain kind of a resonance with the sukshma prapancha or the subtle universe so because of that it has a certain effect of grace which will be missing if you choose only human or human created forms or historical forms which are only totally based on human stories okay so in, instead of that what we can do we can try to do that or if you are choosing a human form just please understand it is going to be only a psychological form it will not give the same kind of the power of grace that we have from the divine forms revealed in the shastra right now if you don't have the samskara if you don't have the samskara for worship through a divine form do not force it upon yourself it's absolutely all right to not choose any divine form for worship some traditionalists will not agree with me but in my experience and understanding and my exploration it is my very firm conviction that saguna upasana or puja is not essential it is useful it is very useful it's very powerful but it is not essential you can do away with that it is just giving that extra prop if it is not that it's all so what that person can do one is not having the natural inclination for uh, worship devata mantra chanting and all that one can what can use one's reasoning one can use the philosophical faculty one can use one understanding and invoke an act from your understanding you can create a slogan or you can use mantras if you don't if you don't know sanskrit for example the mantra is not going to make sense you no know? every time when you are anxious about the result remember sarvam kalvidam brahma the person doesn't know sanskrit you tell the person to remember that now first it becomes a huge tension trying to memorize that this is all unnecessary what you can do is understand the concept of totality there is an intelligent principle that is responsible and it is conducting not in a personal manner in an impersonal manner there is an intelligent principle that impersonally supports the existence and the progress of events and the different sustains all the laws of the universe there is this intelligent principle behind all the laws of the universe there is this intelligent being in which the universe is sustained so that intelligence is available in every point of the universe and i am not separate from that intelligence though because i am identified with body and mind i feel like an individual and my my reach is very limited so as an individual i can appreciate a cosmic intelligence that conducts and rules over the collective in an impersonal way that is responsible for keeping the whole universe together so whatever i cannot control is within the control whatever i cannot you know uh, uh let me hang on wherever i am where it where it is not within my control i understand that it is in the hands of this universal intelligence this universal force in the hands of the totality you can give what name you want in the, in the hands of the universe in the hands of nature in the hands of the totality or in the hands of the cosmic intelligence you can give a name for it you can call it what you want find a name for it uh it's ishvara is a name you can use what name you want god simple it's all in god's hands you can you can call it a him or a her give it a personality if you don't want to give it a personality you can call it as it that because tatva masi thou art that so tam tatpada is that referring to the supreme being as that is the tradition already right so you can just remember that and just fall back every time you have start to take a deep breath just have to let the anxious mind remember okay this is going to happen i'm doing my best and whatever is not in my control is in the hand of the so the hands of 
the supreme being the supreme being the divine supreme will take care of us and whatever comes as a result is a blessing it's enough you know you can also call it as a luck when people call it as luck what people call as a luck they are leaving it you know they are not referring to some supreme being they are just calling you know they are just referring to it as some kind of an unconscious process uh, 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 referring to it as some some undefined thing you know that doesn't doesn't make any uh, uh, it doesn't have an emotional connection but when you see the supreme being or you know the divine uh, the divine intelligence or the cosmic intelligence you know the supreme divine or whatever name you is closest to your heart emotionally relatable so give a name to that supreme intelligence in an emotionally relatable uh, uh, which is emotionally relatable for you and just remember that concept. Just remember that idea whenever anxiety comes, offer the whole situation and that anxious, at the from the level of the anxious mind, just remember that name, whatever you have allotted for that divine being. Just remember that idea, which will relate to the idea. Which will relate to the idea. It's like a switch. The word should act like a switch which will invoke the understanding of totality and its role in every situation in life. Right? So you remember that totality through that word. And let the anxious mind relax. Let that anxiety be, you know, let, let go of that anxiety in the hands of that supreme power. And you will see the same relaxation. A Saguna Bhakti person, whatever relaxation he experiences, whatever uh, surrender he experiences, this impersonal kind of worship person also will experience the same. And that supreme is, uh, you know, that, that supreme uh, presence. But if you are missing a presence, if you are missing a divine presence, and the mind is outside. You cannot think inside. The mind is outside. There are a few things around us which have an inherent manifestation. Uh, 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 inherently, they have a slightly exalted manifestation of the divine presence in them when compared to other things. Like, for example, the rising sun. The rising sun or the sun. If you think of the rising sun in your mind, you can you can use that right sun as a symbol for the supreme supreme being you can use a flame of light you know you can light a lamp in the the flame of the lamp can be considered as a supreme being you can use a shri yantra an abstract form you know the shri yantra is like a structure you know it gives you the idea of everything is connected and the supreme intelligence that is and as everything that is everything and that is behind everything and that is also not everything and that the one that governs everything the, the maker and the materials. So all this idea you can remember by connecting to some symbol that appeals to you. Just explore a little bit. There is all these are available. See the different uh, divine uh, symbols. So there are in nature like the uh, flame of a lamp, Sri Yantra, uh, uh, the rising sun, the moon, um, some, the ocean, or just the mud, the, you know, the ground under us, the, the you know, the ground under us. Uh, one second. The ground under us, just the mud, you know, just, uh, you just feel the ground under you. Consider the ground, the ground is supporting you, right? So the ground can be a representation of the supreme being that supports and sustains this whole universe. Just feel the ground. They say, you know, getting grounded. Also, uh, technically, pranically, it will bring down anxiety. Every day, anytime you feel anxious, if you feel your feet touching the ground, the weight of your body on the ground, immediately that anxiety will come. So that is why walking meditation is also very useful. Right? Uh, when you walk, you feel the touch of the feet on the ground. It immediately brings down a lot of anxiety. So what you can do is just feel the ground under you. It's all taken care of by the totality. Just remember. I have to do my best. And the rest is taken care of by the totality. And whatever comes is a blessing from the totality. Remember that. And go ahead with the action. You will get the same effect. So do not force Saguna Bhakti and waste your time, you know, trying to impose certain cultural things on you. If it is not inherent or natural in you, it's absolutely all right. And uh, you have to analyze this yourself and make this decision. And do not get carried away by any coercion. Uh, cultural, spiritual imposition. It is there, you know, whenever we go to any ashram or whenever we go to some guru or a community, 
they have their own thing. So they will tend to market that, not con sometimes consciously, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, because they don't know anything else could be that. You know? So they will they will try to market that their divine personality, which, which to which they are very impressed about, which to which they have a lot of devotion, but they might not suit you. So that you don't have to take all that. It's absolutely not necessary. Because when an individual is very worked up about one form of devotion, it is that person's problem. So don't let the people dump their devotion on you. That's totally so all right, because it's happening. Every group wants recruits, and spirituality has become a business. And also very important in karma yoga, the most important is do not pray for a certain result. This is extremely important in karma yoga. Kamye Matiste Chatam in Sadhana Panchatam. He says, you know, Vedo Nityama Diyatam, Tadulta Karmas Tanushtiyatam, Tenesha Shividiyatam, perform all the actions, dharmic actions, as an offering to the Lord. Apachiti here. Kamye Matiste Chatam. Take your buddhi out of desire. Mean basically, desire driven karma. It also means desire for result of karma. So, do not do any kind of worship to get results. So, all the parihara, you know, there's a parihara industry. Can, you don't have to go to that. Now, you go to this temple, you will get a special blessing. That temple is powerful than this temple. All this is not required. Oh, you are having this problem. So then you should do this uh, this deity worship. This prayoga is very good and you will get the results very easily. You have to do this specific to go for Dvarana Puja and Rao Kala, all that. No, it's all not required. A karma yogi does not do any kind of devotion for the sake of getting things done. It is absolute fundamental for a karma yogi at Inishwara Pranidana. We are going towards surrender. And the first step in going towards surrender is do not pray for getting things done. That's where the real devotion begins. Not even ends. The real devotion begins. Until the time it's not devotion, it's just trade. So don't do trade with the Lord as a karma yogi. If you don't want moksha, then you can have all the pujas available for you, all the magic available for you, please do. But if you want moksha, no praying to the Lord for getting things done. It is absolute imperative for a karma yogi. So in this context, you don't have to bother about which God is powerful, which God is not powerful. Nothing is required. You, what is required is, am I able to relate to the concept of God through this symbol, through this divine form, or through this idea, or through this word that represents the idea of what I am. And then use this as a background, as a tool for developing the background attitude of surrendering to the Ishwara before, during action, and during the experiencing of the results of the action. And never pray for the sake of getting things done. So with this, we will conclude our uh, discussion on Karma Yoga. And if uh, you have any practical difficulties and when you try to implement it, you want a little more better understanding, please write to me and I will address them in the coming class or I will reply in the comments also. This is going to be there in the YouTube so you can watch that. And uh, we will be able to Make these sessions more useful if there is more interaction and more questions. And if you take home a teaching, implement it. When you, if you implement it, you will definitely have issues that you will have to address, and then you will bring it for discussion. Sometimes some people may be shy, not be wanting to say. If one person discusses an issue, it may benefit all the other people who are discussing that, who are facing similar kinds of issues. So let us have some activism going on here. So let us not be too passive. Just listen and forget and go. So. Uh, participation will be useful for you. For me as a teacher, it will sharpen my understanding, my ability to convey better. Next time when I teach, I will convey much better way because you have already trained me to be a better teacher by asking questions. And then there are uh, other students who may not be aware that this is happening to them, but when you discuss it, when they listen to you discussing it and me discussing the answer and the solution, they'll say, oh, yes, yes. And then they may come up with their inputs. So that's how you improve a tech. So Karma Yoga is a spiritual tech that makes our uh, mind ready for the wisdom of the self. So this gets better and better as we implement it in practice and discuss it and improve it. Right? So we will see in the next class. Until then, I'll do a Shanti Mantra and we'll finish it.
Sir, we have questions in the chat box. We do? Wow. Hmm. So, I have given an unmute option to everyone. You can unmute also and there are questions also. Uh, can, I, uh, can you tell me why my, my camera was going off every few minutes? I don't know, some setting or what? So, sir, there is a question from iPhone Arzu. If we want to pray and ask Lord or nature of strength, nature for strength, faith, courage, belief, will it also come under ah, certain no. results? Excellent, excellent question. No, you can not, you can definitely pray for that because that is not controlling the result of action. That is not result. You are asking for faculty because it is connected with your moksha. It is connected with improving your ability to practice karma yoga. So that prayer is absolutely, please, Lord, give me the courage to face this, uh, improve my faith. I'm having, uh, you know, that is, uh, that is absolutely good. It's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If anybody is having uh, any questions, yes. kindly unmute. There is a question. Yeah. Namaste, Yogi Shri Ji. Namaste, Namaste. Yeah. This is Kanan. Yeah. And uh, the question is <clears throat> regarding, uh, like, for example, for the for the one who doesn't have any background of teachers or uh, uh, learning, mm. uh, you know, like uh, places to learn or to study, like traditional values, we... Uh, like for myself, I begin like with Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda's uh, words and uh, writings, or like Ramana Maharishi, or yes, someone is... who we are not really. Yeah. So, if it is all like uh, institution wise, for just following one particular, like what he said, what is that, you know, like one particular context, okay. we take it for whole life. Yeah. So, how to direct from that to, like, as you were saying, like uh, Saguna. Bhakti, like in a way, like taking a form of one person who is not now, and then how to direct from there to like a real learning or like a further learning, like further into the tradition. The first, you can start with beginning to study the Shastra with traditional commentaries. There are a lot of discourses from qualified teachers available online. Like, uh, you know, um, we have uh, many teachers online uh, who are uh, uh, Shastragyans, those Sotriyas, those who have studied well. Their lectures are there on specific topics. So we can choose a teacher who has a good background, good sampradaya, proper study, and listen to their discourse. And we can attend sessions like this and ask questions to uh, whoever has the, who's, has the background of the tradition. And see how I can Study the basic Shastra, you know, the Prakarna Granthas, like Tattva Bhoda, Panchadashi, then Bhagavad Gita, and you know, the Smriti Granthas, Pratsana, Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita will do, anybody can study Bhagavad Gita. They can start studying Bhagavad Gita with uh, the right commentary. And then they try to understand, you know, this uh, home study course by Swami Dayanand Saraswati is useful. Uh, so they can, they can choose an uh, online teacher. They can attend a course online and get familiar with the Shastra. So when you get familiar with the Shastra, you get you tend to think different. And then you get a certain kind of basic clarity. And as you do, as your study becomes, as you are sincere in your study, it will take you closer and closer to the Guru and you start resonating with the uh, with the field of the Masters. And slowly it will take you to the And try to implement whatever you understand from the Shastra according to the Shastra. So you develop that buddhi, pramana buddhi. So when by listening to that, we give benefit of doubt to the Shastra, to the teaching, and try to develop the pramana buddhi and see how I can apply it in my life over and above my personal interest and make Shastra more dominant over my personal conclusions. I always give benefit to the Shastra over and above my personal conclusions. So I learn to develop that habit. So when, when, the, when I'm able to do that, slowly what happens the grace will start manifesting in a way it will take you to the right guru. The life will take you. The path will take you to the right guru who will be able to guide you personally. The right mentor, the right teacher. And it may not be a It could be a simple you know, a person that uh, uh, 
It could be a person who is good enough for you at this stage of time. So that person need not be the perfect master. You don't have to wait for some, uh, you know, Ali uh, Shankaracharya himself to come and teach you. That is not required. A person who is good enough for guiding you to the next step will do. It will come. It is called as in Swadhyaya Pradishtaya Muktadevata Hamba Yoga. That is a Yoga Sutra. Where it says when you are established in Swadhyaya in proper study and uh, chanting of mantras or whatever, you know, some kind of uh, practice that is connected to a Brahmanisha like Ramana Maharishi, even though it is not traditional, it's okay. Uh, I will not tell it it is not traditional. Uh, it is uh, semi-traditional because Shastra is not involved much. Otherwise, it is traditional. The practice is traditional. Uh, or you are connected with, uh, you know, you are just starting to listening to some discourses from uh, people online and you read some books and you contemplate and try to internalize it, whatever you have listened to. This is Swadhyaya. So what happens? Ishtadevata Sampadhyaya, the Shastra says, that the masters, the ascended masters, and the, uh, uh, those who are living in the higher dimension will start coming in your dreams, will start blessing you, and all that. So basically, it means the grace required for taking you to your guru starts manifesting in the life, and eventually you will be lifted. But what is not compromisable here is Shastra. The one has to somehow find a way to relate to Shastra, if not directly from a guru, at least through online some YouTube lectures, which is based on proper bhashim, not some random... The, just, the person has to come from a sampradaya, and the sampradaya and the teaching has to go according to the bhashim, uh, according to a proper uh, traditional methodology. Then, it will work. Yeah. Thank you, Nandri. The shraddha in the guru has to come, no? Uh, you cannot force it. The person has to come. They have to feel it naturally. You can only you can only suggest that this is the direction. But the person has to take it. Sometimes what happens, you are in the wrong, uh, you are apparently in the wrong, uh, you know, in technically wrong category path. But some punya, you don't know when the right punya will kick in. So only when the right punya kicks in, the person will feel like following us. When the punya is not there, they will not feel like it's all right. It is, it is not our job to bring people to the Shastra. We can only give a recommendation and it's up to people to come up. Any other question? I think it's uh, late. We will finish. Thank you. So until the next class, see how you can understand and implement it and think about it. Any questions, please send. Thank you. Thank you so much. We shall meet tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Thank you, everyone.